Welcome everyone. We're going to get started in a minute or two. Thanks for your patience. And um, we're really excited to talk with you today uh, about optimizing, optimizing automation and controls and con cultivation environments. Uh, this workshop series, this is the first of a four part workshop series and accompanying virtual classroom uh, to serve the Tri-County Regional Energy Network in Southern California. So we're really glad to have you all here today and we're gonna get started. Um, Carmen, would you bring us to the agenda? So today is a two hour workshop. It's a really great time to ask as many questions as you have and dive deep into a number of topics. Um, this workshop, like I mentioned, is going to be the first of a four part workshop series and the three workshops after this are focused on distinct ways of cultivation, sun grown, greenhouse and indoor. Today we're going to address some higher level con uh, concepts as well as things that concern all types of cultivators. So we're going to talk about um, the upcoming energy code changes in Title 24, as well as the concept of maximizing profit and productivity while achieving efficiency. Some thoughts about retrofitting buildings and systems and choosing energy. What types of energy sources will you use and how do you plan to use energy and manage demand? And on the next slide, you can see that the agenda continues with um, some dives into specific things like water management, demand management, benchmarking for resource consumption, and then we'll end with some examples and some program information from one of your utilities, Southern California Edison. And um, then we'll dive into some breakout sessions where you can ask some specific uh, detailed questions to our panelists and have a discussion with other attendees about sun-grown greenhouse and indoor concerns. Like Carmen says in the chat, you can see, please engage with us there. Um, as we go through the workshop, please document your thoughts there, ask some more questions and we'll try and address them as we go. Or we might um, encourage you to bring those to a breakout session. So I'm going to start us off by welcoming you and telling you a little bit about the purpose of this workshop and the purpose of this entire project as we work with cannabis cultivators in the Southern California um, tri-counties. So RII, uh, the Resource in Innovation Institute is a data-driven nonprofit that works with organizations like utilities, governments, and other entities that seek to help cultivators in different regions across the country. We started in Oregon and have lots of expertise that we bring to the cultivation world and have been awarded a three-year grant by the USDA to do the same for growers of non-cannabis crops as well. So we have a membership-based organizational structure in which we gather together lots of different, next slide, Carmen, lots of different types of entities to help us measure, verify, and celebrate the world's most efficient agricultural ideas. So we have a resource benchmarking platform that creates benchmarks and baselines for different types of crops and cultivation environments using key performance indicators for energy efficiency and productivity, as well as water and emissions data. We then craft best practices and standards guidance um, with our members of our technical advisory council. Can you go back a slide, Carmen? and then um, use that best practices guidance to understand how do we celebrate the leaders in, in the industry by verifying the high performance KPIs that they achieve and, and sharing their successes in case studies. Um, our goal is to ultimately certify facilities with uh, the KPIs that achieve beyond baseline. So the goal is ultimately to have something like lead for weed. So we'll see where we go, but here we are today working on sharing best practices and talking about some standards that are emerging for the industry and training growers, as well as the supply chain who works with them. So as Carmen was showing us on the next slide, we have the types of work, uh, organizations that we work with to create this best practices guidance. So today we're bringing several TAC members, um, technical advisory council members, as well as people from the industry like Autumn and representatives from the region like Thomas and Ian to help understand the education and advocacy that's most suited to you. So on the next slide, I'll tell you a little bit about um, the technical advisory council. It's the heartbeat of RII. It's how we create our best practices guidance by gathering objective brand agnostic information and then peer reviewing it before it goes out to the market and sharing it for free. So this month we kicked off our next working group on facility design and construction and the best practices guides that we've written for HVAC, lighting and controls for cannabis cultivators were all vetted and worked on with, this, with the members of the Technical Advisory Council. So our resource benchmarking platform, we hope that you check it out. It is definitely an asset and it's free for cultivators to use. Um, it's called PowerScore. It's available for cannabis cultivators at cannabispowerscore.org. You can use it to create performance snapshots where you can check out 
your performance year over year, as well as compared against our ranked data set of cannabis facilities across the country. And you can use it to get ahead of compliance while also assessing your portfolio, prioritizing projects, and forecasting KPIs for new, uh, for new retrofits that you might be doing. Next slide. Like I mentioned, our best practices guides are available for free. On the left, you can see the guides I was talking about for lighting HVAC and controls. We have a state specific guide for Massachusetts, as well as some other resources for different key market actors. And so now that I've told you a bit about RII, I'm excited to do some introductions of our illustrious panel. I'm gonna do some quick hero bios for them. And then as they speak with us in the workshop, they can feel free to offer a little more context for what they do. So, Joining me today, we have John Crozier. He's the business development manager at Hanson Rice and has experience with food and beverage business development, as well as um, helping cannabis cultivation and other controlled environment ag projects with construction management and design build. So he has lots of experience with traditional commercial construction, as well as specialized um, expertise in the cannabis space like we're talking about today. Ian Logan is a sustainability program specialist with the County of Ventura. And so he's going to bring with us the 3C REN perspective and has a great background in building systems and building performance. We have uh, Autumn Shelton, who has the cultivator perspective and is going to tell you a bit about how Autumn Brands seeks to, uh, seeks to achieve efficiencies while also maintaining the quality that they want to achieve as well as um, showcasing their uh, sustainability. So we then have Jan Westra from Priva, who's coming all the way from uh, the Netherlands. And so it's quite late for him. We're really glad to have him. And he brings a wealth of knowledge from um, academic research studies, as well as with Priva um, doing many different types of horticultural environmental control systems and can speak to both water and climate, uh, climate systems. Kyle Booth from Energy Solutions is a senior engineer and professional mechanical engineer and uh, it was the lead case author for the 2022 California Title 24 Part 6 CEH Controlled Environment Horticulture Report. So we're gonna dive into the proposed code changes with Kyle and he brings a wealth of experience from energy efficiency projects as well. And last but no means least, we have Thomas Lohr, program engineer from Southern California Edison. And he's going to speak about SCE's commercial programs for CEA and uh, also helps explain how uh, cultivators can achieve savings with equipment and controls. So with that, we'll get started and um, dive into the first section of talking about really why are we here today with 3C REN, who's 3C REN and the purpose of today's workshop, remind you how to access the virtual classroom, talk about the next workshops in the series, and then we'll dive into the topics at hand. So next slide, we can see uh, some information about 3C REN. I'm going to invite Ian uh, as well as Erica, if you'd like to chime in here to explain a little bit about 3C REN and why we're doing this workshop series and seeking to educate uh, this portion of your market. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Gretchen. Um, Ian Logan, Program Administrator for 3C REN out of the County of Ventura. Um, with you all being a, a pretty new group of stakeholders for us, I'm just going to give a, a brief overview about 3C REN and, and what we have on offer for all of you. Um, we are 3C REN, also known as the Tri-County Regional Energy Network. Um, we're a collaborative partnership between San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, and Ventura counties um, put together to offer programs and services that improve energy efficiency in the region. Um, we're a ratepayer funded program. These are dollars that we all pay into in our utility bills um, through the public goods charge. So being a ratepayer funded program, we're able to offer these things to, at, at no cost um, to those that we serve. And then as a REN, we're able to return these dollars back to our local economy, which has historically missed out on, on some of these funds. Um, we currently have these three programs. Um, we have the Energy Code Connect program, uh, where we offer industry trainings, regional forums, and a Title 24 consultation service called the Energy Code Coach. Um, the Energy Code Coach is meant to help building professionals navigate the California Energy Code and green building requirements. Um, we have the phone number um, and an inquiry form on our website. I encourage you to check it out um, soon. Any day now, actually, we will be accepting 
text message inquiries as well with the two hour response time. So that's something we're, we're pretty excited about. Um, the training we're sitting in today falls under our building performance training program, um, where we offer trainings on technical and soft skills trainings related to building science principles uh, and systems for high performance, as well as professional certi certifications like the Passive House Design Consultant Cert or the NAR Green Designation for Realtors. Um, lastly, our Home Energy Savings Program uh, serves households that are historically underserved with free and discounted home upgrades like LED lighting, um, insulation, new windows, um, and then the technical assistance and support you will need during the install during your project. Um, yeah, we've, we've got a ton of great resources on our website, uh, like our on-demand training page, um, and then lots of updates coming events through April of next year. Um, I invite you to check out our website, 3CRAN.org, or reach out via email um, if you have any questions about the program. Thanks for that overview, Ian. And so today um, we see kind of four major goals. Um, and so in our work with RII across the country, we're always seeking to help cannabis producers improve the efficiency of their operations. And specifically today, we're going to talk a little bit about how you can do that with controls. Um, like Ian mentioned, we're here to convey scientific insights uh, to share with producers and help them translate how to do those things in their local ecosystem. We also are hoping to help the government agencies like 3C Ren and energy efficiency programs like those at SoCal Edison achieve their climate goals by sharing knowledge with you. And then of course, we encourage cultivators through this workshop and the series to take advantage of the resources Ian mentioned and ultimately support compliance with the county th uh, energy conservation plans that exist in a couple of these counties. As a reminder, today's workshop is just one piece of the pie. You can access your virtual classroom for on-demand viewing of live workshops, as well as tip clips, which we'll show today, which are gonna be shorter little nuggets for you to um, watch and be able to access without having to go through the whole workshop. Downloadable resources like our best practices guides and resources from 3C Ren, including the Energy Conservation Plan spreadsheet for Ventura County. So as a reminder, there's three more workshops in this series and we encourage you to register for them either online through the virtual classroom. There are also going to be uh, quick Zoom registrations as well for each of these. So if you want to just use Zoom and get it on your calendar or access the virtual classroom and, and much more, please check out our December, February, and April workshops, which are going to be on greenhouse, um, sun-grown, and indoor environments. Sorry, greenhouse, indoor, and sun-grown. So we'll finish with sun-grown. And so on each of the next slides, you can see we're gonna have, um, after the fact, you'll get this, uh, there's a handout on, on the virtual classroom. You can click this register button to go to each of them. So this is the greenhouse one, and then the indoor one in February, and then the April one on sun-grown. So we encourage you to register for those and uh, find what works for you. As a reminder, the Technical Advisory Council, the Controls Working Group developed with us the Controls Best Practices Guide. So if you're curious where all of that information came from, those are the organizations that worked with us. And we encourage you to download as a companion to this workshop, the Automation and Controls for Cannabis Cultivation Best Practices Guide. So you can speak the controls language, understand the different control systems available to different horticulture environments, understand how to integrate those controls, install and operate them, use data from them, and then demonstrate energy savings for efficiency programs to maximize your incentives. Um, really great document and we hope that you check it out. It's going to be something to really uh, complement what we're talking about today. So now that we've kind of introduced RII, 3C Ren, the purpose of today's workshop, and you have an idea of the awesome panel that you're gonna be able to speak to today, we're gonna to jump into the content. So the first topic that we're going to dive into is the concept of compliance and competitiveness. Um, I'm going to share here a graphic that combines some data from MJ Biz as well as Leafly and describes how wholesale cannabis prices in California are changing. And it's quite interesting to see how the changes are not affecting growers in the same ways. Indoor growers are having some price stability, while greenhouse and outdoor growers are seeing price drops compared to what was had in 2020. And so we uh, like to share how the balance between productivity and efficiency can be tailored based on where you are in the maturity of your market. Right now, California is having some instabilities and in excess product. And so maximizing output is probably not the best strategy right now. And thinking about how to maximize efficiency while um, kind of 
optimizing output may be something to think about. And so I'm going to hand the mic now to uh, Autumn to describe a bit about how her operation um, deals with these strategies and the market dynamics. Thank you, so, Gretchen. Autumn. Yeah, go Thank ahead. You. Um, well, I'm, let me give a little background too on just kind of the wholesale cannabis prices. You know, this is certainly still a new industry. Um, you know, some of us started in the medical marijuana collective model days and then transitioned in 2018 to the regulated market. Um, and so the prices have kind of always kind of fluctuated a little bit, but not, but not that much. Um, and you always see a downturn in pricing when the outdoor market floods in October and then the prices go back up in the spring and the, in the summertime. And then, you know, COVID times, the, the price skyrocketed. And actually it even started before COVID started in January, we already saw like a really, a really solid increase um, and where the wholesale market was going. And then when the demand during COVID, I think everyone's staying home, getting stimulus checks, ended up spending a lot more money on cannabis. Um, the, the price, the, the wholesale price in summer of 2020 was higher than it ever been. Um, and so this year we instantly saw a decline due to numerous reasons. One, just so much, um, so much product in the marketplace today. Uh, new styles of growing, such as auto flower in the outdoor market, um, the price being so high that people held on to it last year, waiting, thinking it would go back up again this year. Uh, we have a lot more farms online, but not enough retail. So we still have a lot of these counties that are banning um, dispensaries, and we were supposed to have thousands of dispensaries at this point. So we, we just have way too much cultivation and not enough retail and ability to really get it to the consumer. And so the consumer continues to buy on the illicit market. So this has really been a huge issue for us, as well as the cultivation tax, having a flat rate um, has just been, um, you know, a, a huge issue for all of us growers. And, and it was somewhat doable when the prices were different, but today it's, it's certainly affecting um, greenhouse, outdoor um, and indoor um, and growers. So, you know, it is really important for all of us. We're all buckling down. I know a number of farms that have had to let go of 30 employees. I know farms that are now just going to shut down half their operation during the winter because they can't sell the product. So it is really important for all of us to get really strategic in how we do things and, and be as efficient as possible. Um, you know, for us here at Autumn Brands, we really are focusing on, you know, as we always have been, it's really important to to only buy what you need, but become as efficient as possible. So we are investing in new machinery um, that will allow us to become more efficient. Um, we're looking at ways um, to become more energy efficient in everything that we do. Um, so it, it is really important that we, we look at all aspects um, in, this, in this really trying time of the, the market. Thanks, Autumn. I really appreciate that context and the, the description of kind of the volatility and a lot of the different influencing factors. And so um, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit more about some of the strategies that your operation uses and some of the things that we're going to illustrate today, including, you know, managing demand, recirculating and reusing water, and then dealing with electrical service upgrades and making, making use of what you've got. Um, so I'm curious, uh, some, some takeaways you'd like the, the folks to have. Well, we're fortunate that we came, um, my partner had, was in the cut flower industry prior to switching over to cannabis. And so we had a lot of systems already in place. And and we, we have always been utilizing Priva, which has been a great, um, great source for us uh, to be able to manage our watering, our cooling, our heating, our humidity. Uh, you know, that the software really helps us dial in everything that's going on in the greenhouse. We don't have to look out the window every day and go, okay, where's the weather? What do we need to change or what do we need to do? So it's already set up with all these alarms that really kind of put everything into place depending on where the weather is. Um, so that has been a really great resource for us and continues to be. Uh, Water-wise, you know, we reuse and recycle everything that we have and um, really are able to utilize variable frequency drives, which you see right there, um, that really will help manage where we need the water. So, um, you know, right now we'll water about an hour after sunrise and then Depending on if it's sunny, it'll water every hour. If it's, if it's cloudy, maybe an hour, half, every two hours. Um, and then we'll stop about three hours before sunset. So being able to have these systems in place really allows us to be able to focus on other things that we need to do in our business. Um, 
electrical demand. You know, this has always been really important to us to really focus on utilizing our energy in those off peak hours. And so we've, we've really, it took time to kind of dial that in and being able to really look at how our systems work. Um, but we've been really successful at, at utilizing that. So that's really important for all cultivators to really focus on. Um, another aspect is, um, you know, sustainability is everything for us. So like I said, all our water is reused and recycled, all our organic waste is reused and recycled. And reusing and recycling your water isn't always very easy because you still have to dial in all your nutrients. And so really finding that balance um, is a true challenge um, that sometimes we continue to have, but, um, but it's really important uh, for our environment and you know, your other options are to haul it off the property, but um, you know, really being able to dial that in is, is really key. Um, and another thing for us that's, that's truly key is um, pest management. So you know, cannabis is very limited on the number of, or what you can utilize in, for pesticides. And we, in the beginning, started with organic pesticides and insecticides, and then an integrated pest management program. But pretty early on, we realized we're spending all this money on all these, uh, on this integrated pest management, but we're killing them with all any little use of pesticides, even organic pesticides. And, and who knows what these are doing to, doing to, could do to the consumer in the future, right? I mean, it's one thing you can wash your lettuce, but you can't wash your weed is what we like to say. So we went 100% spray free, no pesticides, no insecticides, nothing. And it was really hard. We lost a lot of plants um, in the beginning, but what we've created is this incredible natural balanced environment where we have these native ladybugs that don't have spots on them and they found their way in and they just continue to populate and populate and populate. And so today we bring in pests to combat the bad pests, but we also have the help of the ladybugs. So we're spending half of what we spent on pests control before and nothing on pesticides as well. And now we just really have this great balanced environment and we're providing a product that's pesticide free. That's really an awesome sustainability story for both water, energy, and then other things like emissions. Um, uh, not having you, any pesticides on site means that you uh, don't have to deal as much with them and it, once they leave the site. So um, thanks for sharing that. I, I wanted to touch on the electrical service upgrades and ask, I know that it seems like you've been waiting for a long time to get an electrical service upgrade. And so what have you been doing uh, to make use of the capacity you have? Have you been doing some upgrades to lighting or doing things to replace things with more efficient equipment? Um, yeah, so I'm also, uh, I forgot to mention too, I'm also the president of Carp Growers, which is the local cannabis association here that makes up over 20 properties here in Carpinteria. And we have all, almost all of us have really, about three years ago, applied for these electrical upgrades because these farms have been around a really long time um, and we need our transformers and we need everything upgraded so that we can continue to be more efficient. So the energy we used to use, we used to be able to use before, we can't even use today because all the equipment is still so old. Um, so it's been really important for us to really kind of move through this process with Edison and everything kind of got put on hold and we've finally got um, someone reached out. I think they've set up a, a cannabis compliance and um, team now. And so we're starting to move through the process, but it's still very slow. So we are all very inefficient in how we utilize, utilize power. So it's really key to really be able to get this, these upgrades as soon as possible. Thanks for that perspective. I really appreciate you bringing that. Um, cultivator perspective and um, regional uh, knowledge as well. So we're going to invite Autumn to chime in as we talk about all these different strategies and, and give a bit of that um, on the ground uh, look. And for now, we're going to do a quick tip clip where Kyle's going to give some high level stuff about Title 24. And then we're going to talk with Kyle live about some of the detailed uh, upcoming code changes. Carmen's demonstrating how easy it is to watch a tip clip. Title 24, Part 6, Energy Code updates that apply to controlled environment horticulture facilities. Um, I want to um, be able to bring those um, and, and talk about them in a way that's easy to understand so that, you know, when it comes to compliance with these, it, it's not a headache, it's not a nightmare, it's, it's a simple process that you can walk through and ensure that you're complying with the codes. My name is Kyle Booth and I'm a senior engineer at Energy Solutions. Energy Solutions has been working on behalf of the California IOUs for the statewide 
codes and standards development. Um, we have led the title the 2022 Title 24 Part 6 code development for the controlled environment horticulture measure. With Title 24 Part 6, the 2022 code is going to be effective January 1st, 2023. And the way that code is um, triggered is, is by building permits. So if you have a permit before January 1st, um, this code will not apply to to that project. It's going to be projects that are on or after January 1st, 2023. Um, this will be for new construction facilities. Um, so whether that's a, a new indoor facility or a greenhouse um, or uh, also major alterations. So this could be adding on, uh, you know, a couple new grow rooms or um, adding, you know, adding on to your greenhouse. Uh, those will trigger the, the building codes through the permits. Um, there's going to be lighting requirements for both indoor and greenhouse. Um, and then greenhouse will have um, building envelope requirements for conditioned greenhouses. Um, indoor facilities will also have uh, minimum dehumidification energy efficiency requirements. Uh, there will be compliance manuals that, that are updated to incorporate the new requirements um, these are going to give you a, you know, kind of a checklist to walk through and, and ensure that you're hitting the, the various uh, minimum efficiency requirements for uh, different components in your facility. Um, these should be available by the end of the year for review, and there should be a, a public comment period at that point on, um, you know, how to engage and, and provide feedback and, and suggestions on, on how to improve that. Uh, compliance so it's easy to understand and, and to work through. Um, so yeah, as far as uh, code applicability and you know what what is uh, what is under the code, it's going to be um, new construction facilities, so greenhouses and indoor that are you know newly constructed, it's going to be, major alterations to existing facilities so that could be replacing, you know, greater than 10% of your horticultural lighting that could be replacing an HVAC system. Um, so that, that will trigger the code as well. Anything that needs a building permit to be done um, and meets the requirements within the code for a, a major alteration will, will kind of trigger that. Um, so, you know, to, to think of this in real world, real terms, if you're building a new facility or making big changes to your facility, you'll, you'll want to consult the energy code to see what those requirements may be for the various uh, different additions or, or construction that you're planning. And as far as engaging with the statewide codes and standards team, we have um, a website, title24stakeholders.com, that provides information on um, how to engage on various code cycles and provide comment. It provides resources on what is being planned, uh, proposals for the next code cycle, and that's a good place to find information just on, on what's going on and, and what's planned for future codes. Thank you. Great. So hopefully um, that's a useful tip clip for people to be able to come back to at any time to get the latest on what's eligible, what's applicable, when does it happen, and how can I get help? And so now Kyle and I are going to talk in more detail about some of the what are called measures, the different um, things that might have to be uh, retrofitted, or uh, if you are changing out equipment, the minimum efficiency requirements that might be uh, mandated by the new code. So let's dive into some of them. We're going to start with um, some upcoming greenhouse code changes. Uh, and so Kyle, why don't you tell me a little bit about um, the 1.7 micromoles per joule requirement and um, if there's any lighting controls aspects you might want to talk, talk about. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Gretchen. Um, so with greenhouses, um, the as, as I said in my recording, it's going to be for new construction and major alterations, but um, greenhouses with supplemental lighting, if they have over 40 kW of uh, total connected horticultural lighting load will trigger the requirements of the energy code for horticultural lighting. 
Um, we did a product efficacy, so micromoles per joule or PPE um, for greenhouses. It's 1.7, which in uh, technology terms, uh, this is so. Let me just take a step back. The 1.7 applies to both lamps and luminaires. So uh, if it's a dedicated fixture, no removable lamps, um, the luminaire will be rated under luminaire efficacy. Um, so total luminaire efficacy. If it's a removable lamp fixture like a ceramic metal halide or a double-ended or single-ended high-pressure sodium, uh, the lamp PPE is what will be looked at. So. Um, that means for greenhouses, um, some ceramic metal halide will qualify uh, double-ended high-pressure sodium and LED uh, single-ended fixtures, both HBS and metal halide are uh, excluded. Um, the controls components will be needing time switch controls and uh, multi-level lighting controls or dimming. Um, there are existing sections of the energy code that define the requirements of these. Those are referenced here. So um, that's something um, you know in a compliance manual, which you'll be looking at as you go through your building permitting. Um, you can refer to that section and see what the specifics are for requirements. Great, and so we'll talk about the, the parallel ones for indoor in a minute after we get through the, the greenhouse changes. Um, we're now going to talk a bit about envelopes, so the enclosure around your greenhouse, and um, again, another technical uh, requirement, and this one's called a U-factor. So Kyle, won't you tell us a little bit about the, um, the type of wall construction, and then we're going to talk about insulation, and um, ultimately the types of coverings that are not going to be uh, possible to comply anymore. Sure. First, I want to give a little background as to why greenhouse envelope was brought into the uh, codes process last uh, cycle. And we had heard from some compliance officials in California that were working with greenhouse projects um, that these greenhouses were triggering the condition space requirements of the energy code and were therefore required to meet certain building envelope requirements set in the code for non residential structures. Um, there likely wasn't, you know, a, a clear path written out for greenhouses um, as it was mainly you know, kind of warehouse construction or office or other you know, typical non-residential building construction requirements. So uh, we did this as a code cleanup effort to create a, a clear path for compliance for conditioned greenhouses using normal greenhouse envelope construction materials. So um, any opaque walls will have to uh, meet the existing mandatory insulation requirements in the energy code. Um, Non-opaque walls, so you know, you're glazing, that's gotta be a, a U factor of 0.7 or less for both the, the wall and the ceiling assemblies. Um, there are other factors that play into uh, greenhouse envelope, but uh, they're not in the code yet. There, there may be consideration for them in the future and that's uh, metrics such as visible light transmittance, solar heat gain coefficient. Um, so those you know, may be considered in the future, but right now the U factor was the primary metric that was, was set for a requirement. Um, Thanks, and as Kyle. far as the applications, again, new construction, going from unconditioned to conditioned, it, yeah. that, that is considered new construction. So that's important to note. And then any additions. Thanks, Kyle. So the next couple of slides, I'm just going to level set to make sure everyone understands the terminology about uh, insulation and then also coverings before we talk about the coverings that are not going to comply anymore. So um, regarding building envelopes, insulation is kind of like the building's skin or shell, like the coat in the winter and the sunscreen in the summer. And so um, like Kyle mentioned, the U value is a measure of insulation. And so if you're wondering what is that technical term, it's a way of describing how insulative is that, um, is that covering and how well is it going to minimize unwanted heat losses and gains. And so on the next slide, we're gonna talk a little bit about the different coverings that are out there. You know, you've got your rigid plastic, film plastic, as well as glass. The insulative qualities will depend, but not only on the type, but also on how thick that covering is. And so some of these coverings are no longer going to comply. 
for, uh, for some different reasons. Some things are used for low cost attractiveness, but things like film, film plastic are no longer going to comply without double layers and an air gap. So on the next slide, I'll invite Kyle to just explain, you know, the ones that are being eliminated from compliance. And um, if you click the next, if you click next, Carmen, it'll strike them out. Um, there you go. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Gretchen. Um, yeah. So for conditioned greenhouses, which in the energy code, the definition of a conditioned space is um, 10 BTUs per hour per square foot of supplemental heating or five BTUs per hour per square foot of uh, mechanical cooling um, there that's when you got to hit the 0.7 or less so single pane glass um, single wall corrugated polycarbonate and single layer polyethylene film would not work for a conditioned greenhouse now if it's an unconditioned greenhouse just a hoop house something like that uh, you're not triggering the code so that would not be required there you could still do a single pane glass uh, unconditioned building, um, you know, unconditioned greenhouse. If if that's you know you're not worried about heating and cooling, you just want maximum light transmittance. Um, so yeah, those are the ones that are um, taken out because of that uh, U value, and U value can be thought of as as one over R value. So if you're more familiar with R value, it's it's the inverse of it. We've got a couple questions in the chat. Um, one was, what are the units of U? Um, and so I think Jan from was using some metric units. I think that we've got uh, English units here in the Title 24 uh, specification for what 0.7 is, but um, drop that in the chat um, if you know the units of U. Um, I'm going to ask a specific question of you, though, Kyle. In the meantime, a question about Ventura, um, what qualifies as a significant alteration? Because Ventura only allows cultivation within existing structures, many applications are being submitted for very old greenhouses. The structure footprint cannot be altered under Measure O in Ventura County, but the applicants will be installing lighting, HVAC shading, and other upgrades. Will the new energy standards apply in these cases? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and it's uh, it's really measure by measure. So you'd want to look at lighting, and if you hit that forty kW threshold, then that would be um, <clears throat> considered. You know, you you trigger the the requirements. Um, or with lighting, there's major alteration requirements in the code. So if you increase your number of fixtures by ten percent, so let's say you took an unlit greenhouse and added fixtures, you're, you're automatically going to trigger that. So, you know, these, these retrofits will trigger the code. Um, as far as, you know, let's say uh, the condition space, if you went from no supplemental heating to having, you know, enough unit heaters to get you over that 10 BTU per hour per square foot threshold, you would now be considered um, a conditioned greenhouse and would have to meet the greenhouse envelope performance requirements. Um, similarly, on the dehumidification side on indoor, um, if you were replacing your dehumidifier, that's going to trigger the alteration. So, um, thanks so much, Carl. You addressed another question, which was what is conditioned versus unconditioned? Yeah, and I was so hoping it, to get that in there too. <laughs> yeah, perfect. So, it's a threshold of remind us it was 10 BTUs per. Go ahead. Per hour per square foot. Yeah. And under the definitions in the energy code, if you look at condition greenhouse, um, it should be defined there with those threshold numbers. Great. So let's move on to indoor. And there's some the different ones for indoor, uh, including dehumidification, like you just mentioned. So this is all very technical terminology, but do you want to kind of summarize the gist of this dehumidification standard? Yeah, sure. So with dehumidification, there's <clears throat> there's not a unified test procedure for controlled environment horticulture that we can use just a metric yet. So we went the route of um, specifying technologies that would you know meet or exceed a certain energy um, efficiency. So um, standalone dehumidifiers that meet the minimum DOE requirements would qualify. Um, integrated HVAC systems, so both the sensible and latent cooling and heating, you know, done in integrated unit um, that has to have at least seventy five percent energy uh, recovery or, or reuse for the dehumidification reheat. Um, chilled water systems, similar requirement, having that seventy five percent reheat 
um, be recovered energy. Um, and then solid or liquid desiccant systems for designs that require a dew point below or 50 or below, um, those can't be used for, for any you know, setting they are specific to that, that design point. Great, thanks for that summary. And so um, going back to lighting for indoor, um, the requirement holds similarly, but has a slightly different PPE requirement. Do you wanna explain that one? Yeah, sure. So really the bones of this are the same, just a slightly higher PPE of 1.9. Again, both looking at if it's got a removable lamp, looking at the lamp PPE, if it's a dedicated luminaire, looking at luminaire PPE, um, you know, with having all of the light being provided by the luminaire, the, you know, state wanted to be a bit more aggressive here since this, these are the higher intensity uh, usage facilities as far as energy use per square foot of canopy. Um, so that's why it's, it's a bit higher here. It, and um, yeah, that's, that's the primary reason. And I'll mention that these numbers are being mirrored by national organizations like ASHRAE. Um, so even outside of California, these standards are being considered for all CEH facilities um, as standards are made for places outside California too. So the last one that we're gonna share is um, one that's quite uh, interesting to me uh, about an electrical power monitoring. And so um, this one is, is interesting to me. And I'd love for you to just give a little bit of a comment on how energy monitoring is, is starting to be required by code. Yeah, sure. This uh, electrical power distribution systems requirement really sets up a space so it can be easily monitored um, by designing each load to be kind of uh, separated and able to be you know, attached to monitoring equipment. So. Um, the, the design of the electrical system here can inherently make it easier to monitor. And it's great for folks who want to affect change in these facilities. Having that sort of information enables them to provide more technical assistance and, and financial incentives, sometimes knowing how much energy can be saved with certain measures. Um, the final question about this section that I'll share is, <clears throat> how can people verify lamp or fixture efficacy Will manufacturers provide a specific test or have third party verification in particular for like lamps and fixtures? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, there, there are manufacturer um, listings for PPE. There also are test procedures listed in the energy code to follow for manufacturers that may not be listing those so that they can ensure their, their products you know, are, are shown to be eligible if they are. Um, so those are all listed in the energy code. Yeah, and I'll mention that the Design Lights Consortium Horticultural QPL is also another good reference to take a third party uh, look if a, if a product is certified. So thanks so much, Kyle, for that great overview. We hope that people got the answers they need when thinking about the code changes and are encouraged to see how they evolve. We're now gonna jump into some uh, topics about energy choice. Um, I'm going to describe a bit about uh, these considerations as well as invite John Crozier um, to share a bit about how he works with facilities during the design and build phase to understand their energy choices and how to, um, like Autumn mentioned, maybe get service upgrades. So John, um, would you mind coming and joining me and talking to me about some, you know, sharing some stories about how different growers need to think about uh, energy choice when weighing these different business considerations like OPEX, reliability, and environmental sustainability. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Gretchen. Um, glad to be here. Um, you know, and I think Kyle and, and going through the code compliance and these changes um, sets the stage really well for what uh, growers need to start thinking about or as they're either starting an operation or, or moving into expanding their operation, um, you know, understanding that code and ultimately understanding the equipment and the processes that are taking place in those work areas drive a lot of those uh, choices that you make from an operating expense. Um, you know, does your facility or your parcel have only electrical uh, service provided? Um, are there, is there natural gas supply that you can look at putting uh, to your water chillers or to your, to your heating components um, within your facility? Um, you know, 
reaching out and working with 3C Ren to find uh, solutions and potential gains for your operation and and ultimately your expenses uh, being smart to, to make those decisions, whether you do go all electric or if you do have the ability to, to split that with electric and gas. And so I was curious if you had some thoughts on maybe some recent projects you've been doing in, in, in regions across the country about how um, lead time is affecting project choice and maybe energy choice right now. Um, and whether uh, you're seeing some certain types of approaches for energy choice becoming more popular. Um, we know in other regions, combined heat and power is popular, but in areas like California and others with environmental goals that they're seeking to do more encouragement of renewables being incorporated into these facilities. Uh, yeah, no, and uh, supply chain and uh, lead time on equipment is, is a large driver, not only for uh, your specific systems and your HVAC equipment, but importantly, also uh, being structural components. Um, and, and most importantly, in a facility being steel. Uh, and so, you know, in the event that you are making changes uh, to equipment to help comply with codes or increase efficiencies, um, owners need to weigh their business and the balance of that. And, uh, you know, can they get steel for a structural upgrade if they're trying to put new units on the roof? Um, are they able to even get the units uh, that they wanted to, if they wanted to move to a natural gas system um, and, and the control aspects? You know, we've all seen issues with cars and control chips and, and everything that go into the automotive industry. Well, a lot of uh, equipment providers are, are feeling some of those same pains right now. And so you start to balance uh, the questions of sustainability and, and your desire to grow and comply versus how long can I wait until I have to make a decision to actually just operate. And so yeah. um, there, are, there are a number of, of situations right that where right now where, you know, um, clients are, are having to make those tougher decisions, uh, you know, versus a, a year ago, a year and a half ago, where it was much easier to just say, I can calculate my return and I know I'm making the right decision because of this. You know, there's just like this third new issue in there is like time, like what's, what's yes. time worth and how does that affect my business? How does time affect my energy choices, my maybe sustainability goals? Am I going to be able to achieve it with the equipment I wanted or I'm going to have to make a compromise. So thank you for sharing that uh, perspective. I'm going to share a couple uh, pieces of information from PowerScore and then we're gonna come back to you, John, to talk a bit about energy choice and suppliers um, and then listen to your tip clip about uh, electrical service. So you can see here is a couple images on the screen, um, some information from Cannabis PowerScore on the right, as well as some um, regional data on the left from Massachusetts, which explains the um, the the proportion of energy used for different processes in greenhouses on the left, figure one, and indoor cannabis cultivation facilities on the right, figure two. And you can see that the energy used for the building systems, like John was mentioning, choosing certain HVAC approaches, or like we were talking about earlier with Kyle, um, choosing different horticultural lighting systems can truly drastically influence the amount of energy used, both electricity and fuel, because HVAC and lighting make up, uh, you know, potentially up to, you know, over 80% of the uh, energy use of the facility. On the right, you can see some key performance indicators that PowerScore has. This is total energy use, including electricity and fuel per canopy square foot. And you can see that the, the amount of energy used is, is pretty intense compared to even things like data centers. And this isn't to shame the industry. This is just to say that this is an opportunity um, to, to take control of OPEX, to improve reliability and resiliency of facilities, and then become more competitive. So on the next slide, you'll see um, some thoughts about energy management for, uh, for grows. And there's some pushes and pulls between electricity and fuel, depending on what you're trying to do. Everyone knows that fuel is pretty great for heating things, um, but there's also a desire to electrify HVAC equipment across all types of facilities in the country to achieve our carbon goals. And so um, cultivators may use electricity for things like horticultural lighting, HVAC, 
um, and pumping fans and actuating motors. And on the fuel side, whether you have natural gas service or you're getting a delivered fuel like propane, um, especially greenhouses may be using fuel for heating processes and facilities that choose to use combined heat and power systems may also use more natural gas to create electricity to run their systems. Um, and so on the next slide, this leads to the choices that cultivators have of, well, where do I go with my energy choice? And so John, I'd love for you to chime in a little bit more looking at this list of choices. Um, what are you seeing growers doing in particular in regions like Southern California? Yeah, thanks, Gretchen. Um, you know, looking, you know, at this information, um, you know, the facilities that we've been working with and growers that we've been um, engaged with who are in that region right now and are actually going through this planning phase and this design phase are, are really trying to weigh all of that out. Um, and, you know, much of it is a split that we're seeing right now. We're seeing both a split of electrical components as well as uh, natural gas. So, um, you know, a, a number of, of solutions can be provided from solar, um, but when you start talking about solar, again, we start getting into what I was previously talking about structurally. Can you support the solar panels? Uh, is there a cost to, to being able to do that? Um, energy backup, is your facility, uh, what what are the components that that you're looking at from a from a generation for a, from a generator? Um, are there what systems do you necessarily have to back up versus it's okay if I don't have power for X amount of time? Um, you know, so decisions being made on the the primary function and the core of the business on on energy backup and and generators for backup. So, you know, in our experience, you know, that's really all I can speak to at this point, uh, Gretchen, is I've seen it's basically a, a split uh, on electricity and um, natural gas. Um, and, and everybody is, is continuing to expand and looking into the solar capabilities um, of, of what is possible and weighing out again, you know, where do they find the, the return on that investment? And if it's possible, you know, what needs to be done up front again to to generate that and to create that uh, that movement forward. Thanks so much for that perspective, John. I think it's really helpful for partners uh, like you when working with growers to be able to have the the finger on the pulse of what programs are out there for growers to get help with things like solar, perhaps to uh, potentially if they're considering doing things like natural gas in their region, they might actually be incentivized to consider an alternative solution that's going to keep keep it being electric. So thinking about the programs out there, um, are you in California seeing folks doing solar, getting assistance from the government, uh, getting incentives to do other uh, fuel choices perhaps? At this point, we have not had anyone actually make the move to solar. Um, I think it's certainly something that is continually uh, being driven and, and, you know, with the codes now, um, and I think Kyle can speak to this a little bit more from our understanding is um, in California and the green code with having, you know, I think it's like 15% of your roof space needs to be available now uh, for solar panels. And I would love to have him chime in, you know, on, on some understanding on that. Um, if it's just that, that it has to be available and you don't have to put those panels on now and, and where that might be going in the future. Any thoughts, Kyle, before we uh, watch uh, John's tip clip? I know there might be a 3C REN perspective as well, um, because in certain regions, combined heat and power was good for a bit, but now some utilities and governments are not as interested in incentivizing it because of carbon goals. Um, Jan makes a good point too as well, though, when completely switching away from any fossil fuel system, some growers have used flue gas and exhaust for CO2. So thinking about how the CO2 uh, enrichment process might be done without any fossil fuel on site um, is, is something to consider. Lots of good topics. I'd love to continue the discussion in the chat as I think we need to get back on the agenda. But um, now we're going to hear a recording from John talking a bit 
about getting electrical service. So going back to some of what Autumn was talking about, um, it's a thing that's a whole project. So within itself. <laughs> Like I said, my name is John Crozier. I'm the business development manager at Hanson Rice. We're a 38 year old design build general contracting firm based in Nampa, Idaho. Uh, our specialties lie in, in food and beverage facilities and indoor uh, agriculture. All right, today we're gonna talk uh, from a design and a general contractor standpoint evaluating existing envelopes and existing properties to build out a cultivation space. Um, I would make a huge suggestion uh, on your team to look at getting some type of a feasibility study done. Um, it, it comes in huge with every item that you see on this slide from getting costs, capacities, capital expenses, operating expenses. Um, you'll you'll understand, you'll begin working with the jurisdiction up front in this feasibility study. So um, being on a number of uh, advisory councils like this, the one title and one item that continues to come up is pre-planning and you can't do that enough. So uh, as we go through some of this deck and we look at a couple of these items, I'm gonna touch on them briefly, but my number one request and point would be from an operation standpoint and from your team is to look at a group of individuals and there's a number of them through the RII community that can help you put this study together and help lead you through this process. So when we look at a facility and we look at your operations and we look at the equipment that you think you want to bring into a facility and an existing envelope, Items that we need to consider uh, are the resources that are available. Is there ample power at the transformer? Is there a transformer on your site? Uh, is the KVA uh, amount at that transformer enough? Uh, and if it does say enough, can the jurisdiction um, assure you that that is the amount of power that's truly coming to that transformer? Um, other items to consider within that uh, are your operations. Are you just growing? Are you cultivating? Are you extracting? Are you baking? Are you putting other specialty products out? And how much power that requires. Not having enough power up front is, is a huge issue, but not planning for the future and only having enough power to get started is another huge issue. So, um, Getting a study up front and having the professionals take a look at what's available and having those individuals help you and understand your operations and your goals will help ensure that this site you're looking at and the envelope that you're considering will not only work for you at construction at and uh, initial operation, but will serve you downline as well. Great summary, John. Um, and so I would invite uh, Thomas Lohr from SoCal Edison if you have any thoughts. Uh, we're going to talk at the end of the uh, program a bit about thinking about rates, but it is one thing that we mentioned in these slides. How might you recommend growers think about the push and pull of energy choice when considering the rates that are out there for electricity and gas? Um, well, firstly, I think I would echo exactly what um, John mentioned about just planning early. Um, getting the right people together to do a feasibility study and that you know would um, include engagement early engagement with the jurisdiction the jurisdiction and also with your utility um, with the planners just to just to verify that there is enough power available um, how you know what the uh, you know not just now like John said but also out in the future um, so you know that's one thing and then um, I touch on it a little bit later, but just, um, you know, we want to be, we want to be encouraging the customer, our customers to be selecting equipment that uh, is as efficient as possible, but to have, to, to be able to make sure that the economics of it makes sense. Um, you know, the, the juice is worth the squeeze, so to speak. Um, and then as far as, uh, 
you know, the, how the rates are impacted by that, that's just going to be a matter of, you know, ex really how big your facility is uh, and, and how so much the, demand. Yeah. And so the rates and the equipment you choose might tip the scales towards which energy choice you might make, which, which components you might choose to go with. So we'll build on that as we go forward. Um, but thanks so much for your thoughts, John, as well, Thomas. And we're going to shift over a little bit to water and talk a bit about water management with our Priva expert, Jan Westra. Um, so Jan, thank you again for being here so late in the day for you. And let's talk a bit about uh, and build on the concepts that Autumn was talking about of uh, water recapture and reuse. So will you tell us a bit about this graphic and how the Priva philosophy for um, recycling water uh, can be done by cultivators in 3C REN territory? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Gretchen. Um, yeah, it was great to hear, hear the talk about Autumn about uh, water reuse and uh, and water recycling, and what we well what we drew. And I took out all the equipment because I wanted to be more more agnostic than uh, than the previous show, so to say. Uh, what you see on the left hand side are all the different sources of water that can come into your uh, facility one way or another. And what we advocate for is depending on what you want, that you need some pre-treatment. Uh, it can be for, it can be reverse osmosis when you have seawater, for example, but also think about uh, disinfecting the water that comes in when you have your, your mother plants growing. You don't want any viruses entering your facility at that level. So you, it might be that you do some UV or, or heating disinfection of your incoming water. Another one is when it when there's heavy rain, there can be a lot of bicarbonate in the water, therefore uh, being a pH buffer. And uh, the acidity is hard to control by the, by the units when there's so much of a, of a pH buffer, if you remember from chemistry classes. Uh, then it goes from pretreatment into the cycle. And uh, this, that's where the two arrows uh, come together, where we mix based on electric conductivity for now, uh, the recycling water and the new water, the fresh water, and add fertilizer uh, to the water in the amount. Well, it's controlled on pH, it's controlled on uh, the you know, on e electric conductivity again, so EC. And what we are working on are uh, automated nutrient level uh, measurements. It's still not there. It has to be sent to a laboratory. How much sodium is in the water? How much potassium is available? How much uh, phosphate can I find? And what do I have to add or extract? But usually add. So from fertilization, uh, which can which must be a, quite a, a good controlled system, uh, you go to growing. Fertilization can also be adapted to the amount of water that's uh, transpired by the plants, of course depending on uh, whether it's a hot transpiring day or uh, it's, it's more damp. Uh, we do growing and that's also, uh, well, we, we do weather monitoring, but we also uh, are, are very much in favor of doing a measurements, how much transpiration is there by the plants and how much water is available to the roots. And at the end of the day, literally, uh, we want the roots to be dry again, that they can have their oxygen uptake instead of going to bed with wet feet. Nobody wants that, plants don't either. Um, what we also do is a measurement of the amount of drain because we overwater, well, that's that's very common, overwatering uh, plants when they grow on a substrate. Therefore, you uh, prevent sub uh, precipitation of fertilizer in your substrate and you can accommodate for a small design flaws that one plant, one dripper works better than another one. So they all get overwatered. We do a measurement, how much does come back? And we do a post-treatment to prevent that we spread the diseases in this recycling water. So uh, we as Priva do uh, UV disinfection, but there are other technologies as well, of course. And then it goes back into the cycle. And in this way, especially with an indoor facility, the only water that leaves the facility is uh, in your produce or in, in your waste one way or another. And there's another picture that says something about uh, incoming yeah. water as well. That's mm -hmm. the next thing, the next one, I think, with the, with yeah. the green ones, yeah. So this is, yeah, the next slide shows kind of a uh, a kind of a zoom out of how there's potentially also HVAC systems that are going to potentially for indoor grows have HVAC condensate recaptured. Um, yeah. And so I just wanted to 
uh, have you give a little bit of thought on like the way indoor grows may do this sort of water recapture and reuse a little bit differently and and need to recapture or consider some other things? Yeah, well, one thing we found out in our own indoor growing facility running tests that we had some some growth inhibition and uh, well, what happens in an HVAC unit you in in the coil. Usually they are coated one way or another to prevent uh, corrosion. So there's either copper, zinc, or whatever. And small amounts of these uh, of these metals get into your condensate when you capture it and use it for your plants. And it's well, I'm not a plant scientist, but usually it's not in the organic way that a plant can absorb this copper or or manganese or well in this time uh, copper or or zinc. So it will accumulate in your cycle. So you must take care that you don't have growth inhibition by having these, these metals in your uh, recycling system, so to say. And on yeah. the right hand side, you see some pictures what, what it looks like in uh, fertilizer mixers or UV disinfection units. Great. And, and so another on the next one, yeah, just, just one, another one, oh, which is quite important. And then I'll stop, sorry for that. But when you do a lot of recirculation, the only energy you put in when you keep on pumping, the water heats up as well. So what must be added to the installation, we found out the hard way, is also cooling your irrigation water when you have an indoor facility. Otherwise, it will gradually heat up until it reaches, say, say uh, 80 Fahrenheit or so. And okay. then your growth is really, uh, really gone. Thanks for that note. Um, tempering as well as retreating when considering capturing not just drained irrigation water, but also HVAC condensate. And so um, uh, Priva was a great contributor to the cannabis water report that we published at the beginning of uh, 2021. And we also have some kind of cannabis steering thoughts that are affected by the substrates that you choose. And so um, do you wanna share a little bit about the um, thoughts on drip irrigation and how essentially it, it, it can be a best practice for any type of grower? Um, yeah, it's well, it's uh, like you say, choose your substrate with with what you want. Um, and of course, there's there's runoff, but be be aware that you have precipitation, like I said before, or fertilizer in your substrate when you when you have pockets of non non uh, irrigated uh, sections uh, in your substrate, for example. Uh, understand watering drainage rates. Like I said, you need to flush uh, your substrate to a certain amount, but be aware that you do do it according to what the plant needs. So keep up with the irrigation. Uh, to keep with your irrigation, you must keep up with your transpiration and what the plants use, sort of. Um, well, reduce pumping energy. You, it's not necessary to keep on pumping. Uh, I know from from the the greenhouse industry, growers have have smaller pumps, and in terms of electricity, they multiplex. So every time the pump does a small section of the greenhouse, so you have a smaller pump that can keep on running. And uh, when you have less need of water, you can tune that down by a frequency controllers, for example. So in that way, uh, pumping energy is always well. It's it's over. It's it's might be an oversight, but it takes quite some energy. We built irrigation units with uh, 150, 300 uh, cubic meters of water, and the, the the pumps must be put on with an internal lift. You cannot you cannot carry them anymore. So whatever you do on that amount of uh, electricity uh, pays off as well, of course. Thank you, Jan, and for drawing must, attention. Yeah. Oh, sorry, <laughs> yeah, and drip irrigation is is what we usually think works best. And of course, there are other facilities like uh, what's it uh, yeah, like like uh, uh, NFT or whatever. But uh, yeah. yeah, lots of it's lots of techniques. I really appreciate you bringing up the water energy nexus that, you know, as we do these workshops and think about sun grown uh, operations, that energy isn't non-existent in those in that if you're pumping water, you're using energy. And so thinking about uh, maximizing efficiency for the pumps, thinking about variable frequency drives, and then also thinking about how can the irrigation system itself be uh, as low impact as possible like drip or others. Um, on the right is the image from our uh, controls best practices guide showing the sorts of um, points that water data uh, that, con that cultivators collect on water. And so just think about what you might need to monitor, like what Jan was talking about from EC to pH to you know temperatures 
and um, think about how that can maybe uh, be included in your control strategy as you seek to minimize energy use and recapture water. We're now gonna watch a tip clip um, where Jan tells us a little bit more about uh, the nexus between automation controls and environmental conditions and water. Well, hello everyone. Uh, this is my contribution and I'm very glad that I can have a contribution on the RRI uh, workshops. Uh, this is all about efficient resource management through automation and controls. Uh, well, my name is at the bottom. This is me. Uh, I work at a company called Priva. I'm the strategic business developer and my job is how to find new ways of connecting uh, all the things that go on in a greenhouse or an indoor farm. And so we are very much into how can we tie everything together in terms of controls? Uh, we sell controls, so it's lighting, whether it, we control lighting, screens, venting, uh, HVAC or, or ventilation, but also on top of that, the uh, fertilizer mixing, irrigation, uh, well, and we wanna have a sort of a shallow dive into this. So we start with uh, lighting schedules, as you can see. And what I wanna emphasize through this presentation is that whatever you do, you always have to find the sweet spot between all the different parameters that you can control. And also in terms of what does the plant need in a specific stage, like you can see here with lighting, uh, doing vegetative, doing flowering, blooming. Also in terms of uh, vegetative flowering for how much do you put in, uh, in terms of light and everything around that. So flowers need light, more light. Uh, when you're in the vegetative state, well, it's more relaxed, so it goes uh, more to a lower state. But on top of that, uh, the light is just one aspect of the growing of cannabis. So you have this, for example, in this whole range, you see the temperatures that you can use to steer between the several settings of the plant, but also what you need to do uh, when you have a lot of CO2 rich enrichment, for example, you need the right amount of light that the plants can photosynthesize the, all the CO2 that comes in, but also uh, give the, around, uh, the right amount of water and the right amount of fertilizer that it's not just the CO2 and it's not just the water, but it's also how do the plants build the sugar build the sugar system, system, system during the nights and during the dark periods. Well, the same goes for water controls, of course. And uh, I want to emphasize again the last one. So when do you stop with irrigation? Well, you stop when you think, well, I'm nearly at the end of the growing day, sort of, that the plant's roots can have some fertilizer at the end, but then have a dry out a little bit that they can absorb oxygen and that they go, uh, well, go to bed with, uh, with uh, dry feet, so to say. So all in all, what I want to emphasize again in, in this whole uh, part is make sure that you have everything in place. It's not just one aspect, it's just one aspect. It's you to just make sure that you can really do the steering. Really we think we, uh, we, think we can manage that uh, with a lot of this energy and a lot of this that's already gained. So, thank you very Thanks, Jan, for that summary of some of the things we've talked about already, including lighting, HVAC, and water, and how cannabis growers can steer them to effectively use resources while also automating their growth. Um, the next section, I'm going to kind of go through a few different topics about demand management and um, HVAC controls, as well as resource benchmarking. And I invite any of our panelists to chime in as I go through these for the next 20 minutes before we finish up with our um, our guest, Thomas from uh, SoCal Edison. Before we go to that, uh, check out this article on recapture and reuse that we wrote for Cannabis Science and Tech. If you want to learn more from other members of our Technical Advisory Council working groups, um, there'll be a couple of other little slides like this encouraging you to dive deeper into this topic with a published article peer reviewed by our Technical Advisory Council. So let's talk demand management. Um, demand can be for energy, water, and let's start by talking about the plant because the plant creates those demands by uh, the optimization of its environment. Um, on the right are some, uh, some parameters that may be typical for some growers, but this isn't necessarily um, the, the golden rule, but this is an example of some of the desires that a grower may have to satisfy the needs of, its of, of the plants in the facility. 
And all the systems, lighting, climate management, water, CO2 enrichment, are, are all desired to be automated to provide um, the most support to achieve high yields and high quality biomass. And so um, members of our technical advisory council like Zartarian Engineering really encourage growers to think about how to have a full system view, like Jan was saying in his tip, tip clip on how are we keeping plants happy and what systems and parameters are we monitoring and controlling to do so. So on the next slide, we'll dive into um, some thoughts on electric, uh, electricity demand. And so this is an indoor slide example, but this is still something that's out there for greenhouses. I was just looking at some greenhouse data and checking out some peak monthly demands of around you know, 50 to 60 kW. Um, by growing size can influence your, your peak demand. And so flowering canopy area, um, less than 2000 square feet might have you know, less than 100 kW, but as you get bigger, you're potentially even getting into the four digit uh, peak demand. And so when thinking about how that translates, um, demand charges can be more than half of your bill potentially and can range from two to $10,000 a month given the, the data that we've looked at from some growers. And so managing peak electric demand is something that's going to be a great business decision as well as one that your utility will likely wanna support you with. On the next slide, um, I'll talk a little bit about lighting controls. And so that is one of the major ways that um, both indoor and greenhouse facilities can um, can minimize or manage demand. By dialing and tuning in that number one nutrient with granularity, you can adjust light levels, even change spectra, which actually changes the photon efficacy of the fixture and um, can make it more or less efficient depending on the spectra you choose. Also choosing um, the photo period uh, and using your controls to either be scheduled or use DLI controls perhaps to empower plant growth. So um, lighting controls, the benefit of them is to provide the exact intensity and quantity of light for your plants while minimizing energy consumption. And so thinking about things like dimming or DLI controls in greenhouses are really important. On the greenhouse side and lighting controls, here's some images from a technical advisory council member, Signify, showcasing some of their data that they've uh, accumulated showing how the uh, amount of DLI needed throughout the year um, how the amount of DLI received by your greenhouse over the year changes, and then how much supplemental light do you need to provide to um, give the plants what they need. So there's seasonal light variation depending on summer and winter, like you see in the, in the graphic on the top, as well as the different losses you might have um, through the coverings, whether there's good, I think Kyle mentioned vis visible transmittance, and then regional light variation, uh, the graphs on the bottom. So the one on the left has different colored lines for different uh, places. And so you can kind of see, depending on the, the areas that you're going to have um, by location, expected solar radiation. And California greenhouses can do calculations to understand your light sums, use lighting sensors to uh, inform control responses. And so that's a great benefit of greenhouse lighting controls and something to think about beyond that, those that are required by code. So on the next slide, you'll see a reference to uh, an article we wrote about for the greenhouse grower, um, optimizing systems for cannabis greenhouses. And that dives a bit more into the cannabis steering and, and lighting control strategies, as well as envelope uh, controls for greenhouses, including um, venting. And so on the next slide, you'll see uh, an illustration of one way that indoor growers can, ma uh, can manage demand. Um, others, uh, it's not, this is not just a slide about indoor growers, but the image on the bottom right is for indoor. So let's start with the top. So control strategies, like I mentioned, you can adjust the photo period um, using controls and not have to have your growers manually go around deciding when to turn lights on and off. Um, you can granularly dim uh, light intensity by zones, um, either daily or even by stage of growth. And then um, spectral tuning is a strategy that some growers are using to modulate the different output of photons from the different wavelength ranges. But regardless whether you choose to do a combination of scheduling, dimming, or tuning, um, one of the easiest things that indoor growers can do is balance their flowering rooms. So if you're currently growing in a 12 on 12 off situation with an even number of growing rooms, you could actually uh, take half of those growing rooms, flowering rooms, and have them be on while the other half of them are off. And so the image on the bottom right shows how the demand profile for an indoor grow changes when um, switching from a all on during the day to having more of a third shift that takes uh, to takes 
the plants throughout the night. Um, with automation and controls, you might not have to increase the labor required to do this. Um, there may not need to be a full third shift of staff that comes in and takes care of this if you've got a robust control system. So understand the energy savings potential and the data that you need. Um, in this case, with the cannabis steering um, uh, survey from Cannabis Business Times, over half of growers are measuring um, light intensity and a third of them are measuring spectral quality. So we hope to see more growers measuring and controlling um, their lighting systems and finding good energy savings from them. So the next slide shows three articles we've written on lighting controls for Cannabis Business Times and Cannabis Science and Tech for both indoor and greenhouse on the next slide. And you can check those out. Uh, the one on the far left talks about why LED. Um, the DLC helped write, us, helped write that with us. The one in the middle has more about spectral tuning, as well as the one on the right that dives deeper into the scientific research uh, that's still ongoing on spectral tuning and treatment. Um, I'll dive into HVAC controls unless any panelists have any comments on some of the lighting controls things I just mentioned. Okay, so on the HVAC control side, there's lots of different reasons you might want to do that, whether to maintain the proper environmental conditions, uh, optimize plant growth and ensure that mold, mildew and other pests aren't being bred. And then by having data, HVAC systems are able to create a more stable operation rather than just operating um, on manual controls. Having monitoring information inform the HVAC response can reduce operating costs while also increasing productivity and quality. So on the next slide for greenhouses, you can see an image that shows a, a greenhouse controller on the right with a number of different pieces of equipment that are being controlled by it from curtains to fans to heating systems. And so with Greenhouses, a thing to consider is, like we mentioned earlier, the solar radiation. It's constantly changing and seasonal daily patterns are going to be different by different regions as, as well as individual locations. And understanding the expected solar radiation, perhaps with a horticultural lighting specialist, if you're working with a, a vendor for lighting equipment, or perhaps working with your head grower to understand what are the DLI targets and um, what sort of solar expectation can we get. With greenhouses though, I would say that building envelope is especially important. We were talking about the external enclosures earlier with Kyle about the code changes, but there's also internal coverings like energy screens and shade curtains. And so um, systems like Priva's take in inputs from lots of different environmental controls uh, systems and also um, can deploy and inform the operation of energy screens and shade curtains as well. So. Um, there's a growth by plant empowerment philosophy that's um, used by some greenhouse operators and some use a strategy of kind of keeping a uniform ratio of temp average temperature to DLI. And some have found that that can reduce energy consumption. On the next slide, um, I hit on a few concepts that are extraordinarily important for HVAC controls. Um, monitoring, calibrating, and commissioning. Um, we go into a lot of these in our controls best practices guide, like I mentioned, that's free for download and available in the virtual classroom. But thinking about what you're monitoring <clears throat> and what you're controlling, some systems you might not be able to control but only monitor and use information from those systems to control something else. Thinking about the, the way you're gonna um, use that uh, user interface, whether it's a building automation system controller or something physical, and how do you understand what the sequence of operations are and whether the thing that happened in design ultimately was borne out in installation. That's the important part of calibrating and commissioning. So having the HVAC systems uh, calibrated so the sensors tell you the actual exact accurate information and react appropriately commissioning runs through and functionally tests the sequence of operations, especially in greenhouses with the different staging of equipment from vents to fans to, um, to energy using equipment. Um, for indoor facilities, there's a, a predominant interest in VPD controls to ensure that you're having the proper VPD by stage of plant growth and operate in the right VPD range. You can see on the right that many um, growers are measuring parameters that are are used to calculate VPD. You can't measure VPD ex uh, explicitly. Um, you measure temperature and relative humidity to calculate it. And so um, along with those airflow controls can be a way to, uh, to save energy and improve outcomes for plants um, by modulating supply airflow. Some growers are finding that you can reduce airflow 
at different times of day um, and not affect plant quality. So um, on the next slide, there's a description of vapor, de a vapor pressure deficit, that VPD controls idea in a little more detail. And you can see how vapor pressure deficit is calculated by the difference between the, um, the conditions of the leaf and conditions of the room. And so there isn't really a target VPD that's appropriate for everyone, but understand what VPD range is acceptable by stage of plant growth and understand if you have a very aggressive VPD target that your HVAC system might need to be higher capacity. Like, like Kyle was mentioning, maybe if you have a dew point target below 50, you're gonna have to go to a desiccant system. Or if you think of an environmental condition parameter that's going to be less intense that can still work with more efficient HVAC systems, um, it's really up to you. It's a business decision that balances efficiency, productivity, and, and, and the grower goals. Um, so a couple of thoughts on VPD ranges. We have them in the controls best practices guide on the right by stage of plant growth. Remember their ranges, so find what works for you and dial them in to find that energy efficiency sweet spot. Um, if you find that you're operating at a certain VPD and you don't like the way your energy bills are looking, perhaps uh, tweak and peak and uh, do some changes and see how your bills uh, adjust as well. Similarly for airflow controls, we have some, some ranges that our technical advisory council has provided us in the past. Um, but during dark periods, you may find that you can reduce supply air volume. So by gathering data to validate the performance of these strategies, you can really understand the energy savings potential and, and make great business choices. So um, to finalize a little bit of what I said about monitoring, calibration, and commissioning, remember that you can't manage what you don't measure, but you also can't measure what you don't monitor. So thinking about your strategy for sensing equipment to make that data is really important for you to say, I'm going to save energy doing this, you know, efficiency utility, could you give me some money for this project? Or even, hey, you know, investors, can we do this project? Um, and then moving through that, once you actually install the equipment, it really ensuring sensor accuracy is important, as well as making the data right, it's going to in, uh, as well as making it more accurate, you also have the opportunity during calibration to configure how quickly your systems respond to those inputs so that they maybe aren't constantly cycling on and off. So on the last slide here, we've got some more uh, articles that you can check out on um, empowering plants with environmental controls, avoiding crop loss, and then in integrated pest management to follow up on some of what Autumn was talking about. So I'm going to um, join with me, uh, Ian, a little bit to talk about some of the benchmarking regulations that are out there in the Tri-Counties area. Um, we'll talk about Ventura first, and we're going to talk a little bit about the energy conservation plan, how, who it affects, and um, the options that growers have to comply. Next slide, please. So Ian, um, do you want to chime in here and comment on maybe the, the goals of this regulation and how growers can um, make the most out of it? Sure, yeah. Um, well, so for the County of Ventura, um, all cultivators when applying for a cannabis business license will have to uh, sub submit an energy conservation plan. Um, mainly it is to dem demonstrate a 25% reduction of anticipated conventional energy use. So um, the baseline for Ventura is um, a baseline calculated by RII based on like a conventional uh, cultivation operation of the same size. So it's based on size. Um, yeah, so basically to comply or meet these reductions, um, there's either going to be renewable generation on site um, or en energy efficient technology on site like these lighting and uh, HVAC systems we're speaking about. Um, but then you can also comply off site by enrolling in the uh, Clean Power Alliance or SoCal Edison's 100% Green Power Program. Great. Thank you for clarifying the pathways people have to comply and, and ultimately rem a reminder that this is a way to compete as well. Um, and so on the Santa Barbara County side, there's also an energy conservation plan. Um, it's a little bit different. Uh, it affects uh, not only, if you could go to the next slide, Carmen, not only indoor cultivation and mixed light, but also nursery manufacturing and distribution operations. 
And their uh, target reduction is slightly different, 15%. And, um, and any comments on this one, Ian? I'm going to talk a little bit about the, um, the ways that they can conserve energy. They have a little bit of a longer list. Um, mm -hmm. Carmen, do you want to show the, that on the next slide? So there's two slides of these, actually. These are all the different things that you can do to, to achieve those 15% reductions from participating in an audit, upgrading systems from lighting to HVAC, using natural light. And on the next slide, we also have um, ensuring that energy use is below benchmarks and participating in some, some California-specific programs. Um, yeah, any thoughts? So yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think I think the unique uh, things here for measures you can take would be like the voluntary participation of Cal Green, um, which would be a measure that you would take when um, complying with Title 24. So probably good to get familiar with that as um, Title 24 moves into this industry. Um, and then another program, the Smart Build Santa Barbara program, which is basically a consultation green building program where you can work directly with somebody to implement energy efficient technologies. Um, the baseline for Santa Barbara is a little different because it's based on um, historical utility data based on the specific project site. Um, so similarly to Ventura, you can only operate in a uh, previously developed location. Um, yeah, I think that that's kind of unique to, to both Santa Barbara and Ventura, but um, yep. Santa Barbara is based off of, you know, what was what sort of energy demand was taken um, on site historically. Yeah, no matter the previous use, which I find quite interesting. Um, mm -hmm. And so on the San Luis Obispo side, they have yet a slightly different unique regulation. Um, their regulation is triggered when CEQA, um, the environmental uh, <laughs> regulations are triggered for um, depending on new construction or major renovations. Um, they have their own specific electricity use calculation form that estimates the potential electricity demand for the facility. It does not address non-electric fuels. And so on the table on the bottom right, you can see the way that they've used those calculations to estimate typical uh, uh, projected energy use for indoor. And then I also at the bottom included um, what they have for mixed light and outdoor. And ultimately they want to see in the energy conservation plan how they're going to be offsetting 20% or more of that compared to a commercial building of the same size. Very interesting, Ian, do you wanna explain a little bit about this one? Um, um, I'm less yeah, familiar so, with it as well. <laughs> well, I think I think unique here is that the commercial building, you know, is a generic commercial building, um, realistically requiring a, a whole lot less uh, energy from the grid. Um, you know, similarly, it, it can be in, complied with by energy efficiency, um, green building techniques, or enrollment in a, a community choice aggregate um, program. Um, and then, so once environmental review does distinguish uh, significant environmental impact, there are kind of two additional tiers compared to Santa Barbara and Ventura, where you would have to um, also meet a greenhouse gas emissions reduction requirement. And then there is um, kind of quarterly monitoring of energy use and emissions, whereas Santa Barbara and Ventura are annual. Thank you for that clarification, it's very helpful. And so <clears throat> I'm gonna go through the next few slides a little quickly so we can get to the um, examples and uh, programs for SCE, but this is important stuff. Power score is the way that the, S the baseline estimates for Ventura are calculated. And it's also a way that you can benchmark your facility for resource efficiency and productivity for free and inform your energy conservation plans. So we have key performance indicators for efficiency, productivity, lighting specific indicators as well. Um, we also have some water key performance indicators that can help build on your understanding of, thank you, Carmen, uh, my video is off. Um, water performance indicators on the next slides that can uh, showcase how well you're um, intensely using water or maybe reducing demand. And on the next slide, uh, if you want to, you can also participate in PowerScore Pro to um, understand how your portfolio facilities performs against the ranked data set 
of growers. So um, I'll shift over to just explain how I think that net zero carbon cannabis is possible. These regulations in these regions are with an altruistic goal of getting us to resiliency and energy conservation while also minimizing greenhouse gas emissions. And so I just wanted to share that, you know, it is possible to um, reduce energy use and uh, as well as water while still achieving kind of typical uh, dollars per square foot. Um, $300 per square foot for this indoor facility in Ohio, achieving a uh, lead platinum, I believe, or sil at least gold. And then on the next slide, you can see that if you're thinking about building out our facility or improving your existing facility and correlating the amount per square foot you pay for that build out, as well as the amount you're potentially going to get for your product, it's really important to think about how are you going to balance the benchmarks that you need to achieve maybe for uh, sustainability, but also for profitability. So um, I'll close this section out by just uh, reminding everyone that, you know, all three of the local utilities, SoCal Edison, pg e and SoCal Gas, as well as community choice energy providers like the Clean Power Alliance for Ventura County, Central Coast Community Energy for Santa Barbara and Slow Counties, and a local CCE that covers just the city of Santa Barbara, are all focused on helping people get to clean energy sources and minimizing the environmental impact of cultivation. So we wrote a guest column for Cannabis Business Times about the carbon emission impacts of greenhouse cultivation and energy choice and location make a big difference. So um, take advantage of the programs that are offered in your region and consider how your fuel choice is going to impact your sustainability. And I'm really excited to bring Thomas back to talk with us about, you know, if people take this advice and they start early and they think about the partners they want to work with, um, utilities and efficiency programs being a key one, how can growers in these counties take advantage of your programs and engage with you? Thanks, Gretchen. Um, so again, my name is Thomas. I'm an engineer with um, Edison's business customer division. And one of my core responsibilities is uh, to support the development and implementation of energy efficiency programs uh, with our business customers. And lately, you know, I specialize in working mainly with our cultivation customers. Um, so I understand many of the unique market characteristics and the circumstances that uh, you know, this industry faces. Um, so actually, should we go back one slide, Carmen? Uh, oh, yeah, I was moving forward uh, because oh, we just sorry. wanted to say that Pacific Gas and Electric and those other utilities are out there. Today, we're talking about the SoCal Edison programs. Got it. Um, and I just want to point out too that, you know, yeah, San Luis Obispo is not in Edison's territory, um, as you know, you, you well know, but um, a lot of the programs that are offered by investor owned utilities in California are available statewide. Um, so kind of regardless of where your territory is located. And if anyone has any questions, regardless of whatever territory you're in, uh, just feel free to reach out to me directly and I can likely connect you with who you need to talk to. Um, so, I think go back one, Carmen. I think Thomas <laughs> is going to explain like why efficiency programs are important. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, just because a lot of the times um, when we do engage with some growers, a lot of growers who aren't really familiar with energy efficiency programs kind of wonder like, oh, what's in it for Edison? Like, why do you care to engage us and help us to be more energy efficient? Don't you make money off of us using more energy. Um, and so I just wanted to talk to that a little bit. Um, you know, the, the, everyone's heard of the saying, of, you know, penny saved is a penny earned. And so, you know, EE energy efficiency is the most cost-friendly form of energy for both the utility and for the customer. Um, it, it's the easiest way to eliminate energy waste and thus it lowers energy costs for both parties. Uh, for the business customers, we talked about this earlier. Um, I think it was Autumn that, that mentioned it to start, but reducing energy costs improves your bottom line, uh, allowing you to be more cost competitive, especially with you know declining margins and, and the dynamics of the legalized and not legalized uh, market that, that, that's paramount. So, um, you know, the, also the, what Autumn also talked about was uh, grid strain and the viable, availability of electricity you know using less electricity for a given capacity overall means that there's less strain on the grid um, it means fewer instances of rolling blackouts and, and flex alerts and 
it helps us to keep the power on, which is obviously a benefit to uh, cultivators. And that by definition is resiliency. Um, and also touching on what Carmen talked about, or sorry, uh, Autumn talked about is that, you know, utility infrastructure, it's, it's an arduous process. It takes a lot of time to build. It's a process that plays out over many, many years, um, depending on the need, um, especially in areas of booming demand. So one kilowatt saved by one customer means there's potentially one kilowatt of electricity for another customer or for that or same customer to have enough capacity to be able to expand where they are. Um, so, and then um, the last, you know, reason why it's important that I want to talk about is just that, you know, the clean energy future aspect of it, you know, in, in addition to the obvious, you know, environmental benefits, uh, more and more businesses are making it a priority to adopt uh, sustainability and, and efficiency goals, you know, it, it, because they see it as a form of corporate responsibility, yes, but also because it's a marketable practice that it's becoming more and more important uh, for environmentally conscious consumers, uh, so, you know, so that presents potentially another value add for the business. Thanks for that uh, overview. Um, energy efficiency programs are here to help, and the utility is not um, is not someone to protect information from. In some ways, you're they're there to really help you plan out as early as possible these capital projects, so that they can improve resilience and and reduce your energy costs. And so um, some images on the next slide showcase some types of cannabis projects out in the marketplace, um, indoor greenhouse, lighting retrofits, um, other, other system retrofits. And so um, why don't you tell us a little bit about the programs that are out there for producers of all types in the cannabis environment? Sure. Um, so just before I touch on, on these programs, um, something that I think I should just preface it with. Uh, just to provide some context is that, uh, as many people probably do know, the California Public Utilities Commission, the CPUC, governs much of what uh, regulated investor-owned utilities can and cannot do, and often, you know, more times than not, instructs us on what to do, uh, and that includes how we operate the, um, the EE programs. So, at the direction of the CPUC, there's currently a big shift happening with our EE programs. Um, many of them are in a state of transition to be offered by non-utility entities, basically by third-party energy solution companies, uh, you know, who are also given you know, the responsibility to design the programs. Um, so that's happening now. Um, so as a result, you know, I'm limited today, unfortunately, in what I can and cannot share in terms of the details about the new programs. Um, I can really only speak to how they work in general and then how they worked when we offered them. Um, so having said that, uh, the first program that you see on there is the California Energy Design Assistance Program, CETA, and it's offered by a third-party energy solutions company called Wildan, a uh, brand new program specifically for commercial new construction. Um, and I was told that the incentive program does cover indoor horticulture applications, many of the measures that we talked about today, um, if not all. Uh, it's only been online for about a couple months and the details around the eligibility and the incentive rates and things like that for indoor horticulture specifically haven't been made available to us, but if you go to their website, you can get in touch with one of their representatives and uh, they can get you all the details. Um, it is a custom program, which, means that the potential incentive amounts are based on engineering calculations that are specific to your project. And it will require some form of site verification and measurement and verification once the equipment is installed to validate that the calculations were appropriate. Um, and in general, you know, the calculations compare some, compare the estimated energy use of some baseline uh, equipment or strategy that you would otherwise have to use, like say something governed by code, um, or that you would very likely choose to use, like, you know, as in it's a no brainer, everyone should be doing this anyway. Uh, and they compared the, the estimated energy use between those two scenarios and uh, 
or sorry, between that scenario versus uh, the energy use of you know more efficient equipment that you're proposing to use, all else equal, and the difference between the energy use of the two is your savings, and that determines your incentive amount. Uh, and then one thing that you know applies to all types of custom energy efficiency programs that's really important to highlight, especially for this industry, is customers cannot purchase the proposed equipment until the EE program application is completed and approved. Um, and you know, the final incentive amount is often not guaranteed until after the equipment is installed and verified. So it's just something to keep in mind. Um, and then, so the second program I'll just touch on real quick is the cust customized program. So it's uh, similar to how CETA is available for new construction. Uh, there is a program specifically for existing buildings and retrofits that is still offered by Edison, uh, but only through the remainder of the year. Unfortunately, it's uh, beginning next year, it will also transition to a third party and it may or may not change dramatically. That's still to be determined. Um, it is also a custom program. And so it functions exactly like, you know, much like how I talked about, uh, the main difference being that the baseline or equipment strategy is typically your existing condition. Um, and you see the incentive rates there and you see my contact information. Um, let's go to the next slide. I'll touch on those examples really quick just to uh, give you an idea of the potential magnitude of the energy savings to be realized um, and possible incentives you know, to help you procure the equipment to make this possible. Uh, so in these two cases, these were specifically in SCE territory and uh, all it entailed was uh, switch out of legacy lighting to LED. Um, there was no controls element or, or even H uh, interactive effects associated with HVAC captured in any of these savings. And so this is just lighting only. Um, and so we would say that the, the savings that you see there uh, are conservative. Um, yeah, so, and they're and they're getting a you know is IMC the the cost of the project and then incentive is how much correct he paid so yeah with correct. this project on the left they're getting you know nearly half of the lighting fixture or project cost covered um, with the incentive correct and so uh, you know the technical assistance that Edison and and PG&E would provide is to help help with these types of calculations, help um, with the economics, showing the different use uh, scenarios uh, to you to help you make that decision. Um, so yeah, you can see that one, one faci facility was a greenhouse, the other uh, warehouse. Uh, next slide, please. I think these talk about um, lighting controls that as, you know, facilitate the reduced uh, lighting hours of use um, and often these types of projects are, will require a length, uh, you know, a longer period of measurement and verification, like I said earlier, just to make sure that uh, the proposed equipment and uh, the strategy is kind of operating as, uh, you know, the calculations kind of predicted. But you can see there, you know, 14.1 kilowatt hours of savings and 50, you know, 1.6 megawatts basically of, uh, demand reduction annually, uh, that, is, that is not insignificant. And you know, you just, the, these two projects received about a million dollars worth of incentives from the utility. Mm -hmm. uh, last slide, I believe, talks about, mm -hmm. uh, so also you know, projects involving HVAC controls, uh, one specifically for dehumidification, the other one uh, for hot gas waste heat recovery. Uh, again, you know, there are not insignificant savings to be had, both in reduction of your annual energy use, energy, annual energy bills, and uh, the amount of incentive that you can receive to help offset those capital costs. Thanks for walking us through these examples. Um, so this is just to say that all of the stuff we talked about today about demand management from lighting and HVAC equipment to controls and automation, there are great savings to be had in OPEX as well as buying down the first cost of that efficient equipment. 
So um, I'll hand the mic back to you, Thomas, to talk a little bit about rates and demand response programs, and then we'll be finishing up with the Q&A. Yeah, I just wanted to bring to everyone's attention that there are, um, Edison does offer agricultural rates for indoor horticulture customers. Um, you know, they are, you know, depending on whether your facility demands uh, less than 200 kW or greater, uh, you get either put on the time of use PA, which stands for pumping an agricultural rate uh, two or PA three. Um, and, you know, that's gonna be more beneficial to you in terms of, you know, dollars uh, than would a commercial general service rate be. Um, the only caveat there is that you begin, you qualify for that rate uh, once you start growing the growing process. Um, typically this, the rate gets assigned when you, you know, when you're setting up service and you're engaging with Edison, you're talking to the account managers and whatnot. Sometimes that doesn't always happen. Um, especially in cases where you're moving into an existing building where the use case was something completely different. Um, and so you know, we may not be aware that you are now a, an agricultural business. Um, and so it's really important to engage with us to, you know, so that that's on our radar. Um, and then lastly, we talked a lot about controls. Um, demand response is also a program uh, that, that we offer, you know, you know, there's, you can receive discounts for it, incentives, bill credits, we can send you equipment to help facilitate that. Um, and I think I'll leave it there. Yeah, yeah, so thanks yeah. so much for rounding out this great panel on strategies as well as uh, partners who can support you in achieving automation and greater efficiency in your greenhouse and in your indoor grow as well as in your outdoor operation. So. I'm gonna open the floor to questions now and uh, have Carmen facilitate that discussion. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. Our contact information will be on the last slide. Carmen? Hi, um, does anybody have any questions for our panelists about either sun-grown, greenhouse, indoor types of facilities related to controls? Just feel free to unmute yourself and speak up. We're going to do a broad question session instead of a, a breakout room session. So feel free to turn your video on, unmute yourself, chat, drop things in the chat. What about any panelists who might have questions for each other? Apparently, we answered all of the questions during the workshop. Um, but we encourage you all to be in touch. If you click the next slide, Carmen, I think our contact info is on the back. And um, and please ensure you uh, keep engaged on the virtual classroom. This live workshop will be recorded and available for you to watch on demand, the tip clips too. And um, the next workshops are available to register for and we'll be engaging you in the interim two months with, with more content. So thanks for joining us. <laughs>